Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining today. Let me start with a declaration here. And the declaration is that uh, the declarative way is a very good way of programming in general. And uh, and we'll, we'll try to take a, a view and stab at how declarative programming works. But I would say the job of a programmer, of a C++ programmer, is to create a specification out of the code. And uh, it is for uh, to make the compiler generate as much code as possible. Because, hey, if you don't write much of the code, you don't own much of the code, there is not much regression, and you can go over speed over time. OK? So uh, with those few things uh, at introduction, I would just like to ask, uh, can everybody just reach out to the reaction buttons? Uh, can you tell me if you think we are paid to change bits and set bytes and uh, move data from here to there? I think that would be a fair description of what we do for a living. So thumbs up if you agree or any other if you don't. Right? So a few others, but most thumbs up, right? So we do, uh, thank you very much for your reactions. Keep them coming all through. Okay, so uh, what I would say is, moving the bits around, setting the bits and bytes is one way of achieving what we have to do. So what we actually do is adding value, okay? So we'll just take a quick look at that. Uh, that's me after the kind of introduction I got. I dare not speak another word. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind words. Okay, so it's the value which we provide is the key for, uh, uh, is the whole objective of what we do. And we have value coming in uh, by, by doing more and more higher level stuff. You have the hardware at the bottom and the OS and the drivers and runtime of the uh, operating system, uh, runtime of the programming language and the program. Uh, these are the things uh, which uh, I have marked as stars if you go from bottom. Uh, some of us get to work on, some of us get to work on SOCs and uh, embedded systems and drivers and system modules and Linux modules, etc. cetera. Uh, but many of us work in the zone between the red lines, which is the technical solutions to known problems. Here, technical solutions would be uh, things like uh, a vector, uh, things like uh, uh, a, a, a complex number, uh, things like uh, UN32, okay? Functionality would be uh, things like uh, sorting uh, or uh, actions and, and, and data structures, algorithms, etc. Even functionality could be things like dealing with command line or things which add value, okay? Then using these, we build subsystems and the subsystems own a, a part of the entire problem domain. And using those subsystems, if we accumulate them, we create systems. These are the parts where we have uh, a lot of influence and which is where C++ fits in. We also definitely work on a set of systems and services. I'm working in the cloud. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, 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 having, work, having worked in the cloud, it is very important that the systems and services are able to speak to each other. There is efficient uh, and, 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 and clear interfaces and also interactions between the services and they are secured and all those things come in the picture. Building those, uh, accumulating those things, you build products and finally you build solutions. It's the customer's problem that you're solving. Even uh, in the previous hour when we had the talk, uh, this, the problem that you're solving, it was mentioned, uh, is is very important, and this these are ways of doing it. So let's see what maybe uh, declarative ways we can do. So I just like to quote Roosevelt here: "Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds to discuss people." In our computing world, what does this translate into? Is that we need to think higher level, and we are at uh, we we have the almost a a very good tool. Uh, in order to do high level activities uh, without with the zero cost abstraction that C++ has, uh, the optimizations that have been put in in the language right from the beginning and even they are being put in and the ease of abstraction which cost you 
uh, nothing like I said, zero, uh, zero cost. The deterministic things that C++ gives, okay? So uh, these are some of the things that we have. But let's first look at the, uh, you know, the uh, some of the declarative options that are there out there. So if you see, SQL is uh, almost a poster child of declarative, I had to put it first, of, of declarative programming. Here you say what you want. You are asking for country, some summation is happening from which tables, how you are joining, whether you want inner join, outer join, which one, how you want the things to be grouped by and totaled up and ordered by, etc. So you are exactly specifying what you want, declaring what you want, rather than telling to the database how to do it. Okay. Uh, you have uh, low level networking where something like this, uh, uh, an IP header defines what is there in the message and there, there is uh, you know there's the relative positions of the things and exactly the specifications of what every value really means uh, we have uh, higher level messaging definitions for example it is so crisp and clear if you read from the top a set message is either a request or a response if you see here uh, a request is has a request line this is the same for http by the way request line uh, uh, and the response has starts with the status line and then following by that there are message headers and body. Now request line has this specification, the body has that specification. It's just so clear and direct. Regex, what does a regex look like? If you match these things, you know you have an email ID and it's uh, that uh, very, very straightforward, okay? If you have APIs, we have REST APIs, which specify exactly what two systems need to do in order to be able to interact with each other. And here you see some of these lines, you just say that uh, which, oh, I'm sorry, which host you are talking to. Uh, you have, uh, you can say what methods you are, uh, you are working on and what happens when get happens, what does a 200 okay response look like? That there is an array. <laughs> Uh, you can even specify in the array what is the minimum and the maximum number of elements. You have a post and in the post there has to be a body which is uh, definitely required and such things uh, even down below I guess there is a shortening of the image or something. There is other specification which very clearly says how the request response etc should work and these compile into your programming languages and we have the thing ready. This thing is a cloud deployment, uh, uh, very much the buzzword. And uh, all you have to say is that there is a deployment and that there is a replica, this value is one or 10, uh, the cloud will work uh, to make sure that that is the case. Even if you lose a pod or something, uh, it will be restarted and you will have, uh, you know, uh, the, the reinstatement of the lost service, okay? Which image you are running? Not much more than that, you have to specify that you're running protocol TCP on port 3000 and the target port is also 3000. So these are just things that you say, uh, ask the cloud for and you get it. This one is very close to how we, what we work on, the CMake. CMake is, and make files uh, are so declarative that you just say, you know, what is your executable? What is the name of the project? What is the minimum version you want? What is the C++ version you want? That you want to find a package and whether you want to include some directories and so on and so forth. I'm sure you know about all of this. So it's so good and uh, there can't be uh, much to debate about that. You know, there can't be many, many hidden errors here. Uh, of course, life happens, but uh, by default, you get very, very crisp and clear ways of expressing what you want. I guess by now, I'm sure you're convinced. And uh, I hope I don't have to tell you any more about this. And how do we implement our things? We have this function, uh, flush streams. It's taking a streams vector and it is going through the things picking streams one by one and checking buffer occupancy and it is flushing the buffers uh, based on some threshold or something and uh, it is counting the number of times it actually flushed. Okay, but any issues with this code? I wish we were in person. Any issues somebody wants to mention? You know, 
it so happened that uh, maybe there was a refactoring or a while loop turned into four, and this happened where the i is incremented two times. Not only that, that's an auto, not an auto ref. And that would make a copy, right? So many things to go wrong. This stacks number of flushes is great. It's just a number increment. But in these days of Prometheus statistics, etc., every stat increment is actually uh, an atomic increment. Uh, these counters are atomic, uh, at least in Prometheus world, in the cloud world that I, uh, I, I work in these days. So, you know, in every loop, as you go so many times, you will hit that line and you will do at atomic operations, which maybe nobody was waiting to know about. You could do something about it. And you see there is uh, there is a hard coding there, which is not, not right, not explained. Uh, with time, you might want to change and do something else, but you have hard coded it. Okay. And over time, our designs and uh, architecture is impacted by time. You know, uh, we always start clean. The intention is always there, but life keeps on happening, pressures and deliveries. And uh, what we end up having is complexity. And this is the exact thing which declarative code, as we have seen uh, in so many other examples, tries to address in some way. Okay, uh, and there is a there is a tipping point. This is uh, uh, you see this kind of a graph uh, all over the internet. There is there is consistent study. Sorry, I'm not quoting the study, uh, but here you can see that beyond a threshold, the degradation is so much that the complexity burden overweighs, and you hear of rewrites, etc. So it's always good to keep on acting and be in the improvement zone, and not to land in the complexity. And which is why I'm giving this, uh, I'm having this discussion with you on my thoughts on declarative. Okay, uh, so it does impact, time does impact. Is everything we build is already legacy, something that we want to right away change uh, already? Well, it's not a, not a good thought. And uh, I hear you, even though I can't, but I hear you. I think you're convinced by now. So I'll move on and discuss the declarative approaches that we can have uh, about it. And we have been uh, we have been looking at uh, other things and talking in uh, in generic terms. Let's be objective now. So uh, declarative style is something that expresses the logic of computation without describing the control flow. You're not telling to the con a compiler, you know, do this, do that, go up, come down, increment this number. You don't want to say that. We end up doing that a lot. We end up jumping, we end up breaking loops, we end up looping, we end up having conditions. Uh, and all this adds to the fatigue, the mental fatigue and decision fatigue that we can get and making the systems complex. Okay, so we would all love to not have to have this. So what is declarative compared with what we do? Usually, generally, I think I can say that unless somebody really, uh, so I want to also learn if any of you is already practicing some declarative thing, I would love to see the chat. Uh, so we compare declarative with the imperative approach. Imperative is when you say how things have to be done. What are the commands that you're asking the compiler, or the I'm sorry, the processor to do, uh, do these things. And you are in, in the middle of control structures. You are deciding where to go from here, uh, deciding things. Uh, and uh, and things of the like. On the declarative side, instead, like we have seen in many of these examples, you actually uh, look at uh, specifying what you want from the compiler. Okay, uh, what you want happened. It, it is dealing with expressions rather than statements on the left hand side. It is dealing with pipelines where one data is processed and uh, it, it's dealing with uh, into it, it is dealing uh, in uh, it is being dealt with in a chain of operations and you get your final uh, task achieved and every step is just a little uh, little step uh, little step in the overall processing okay uh, procedural uh, and you don't tell how the you know looping should happen you might be dealing with tens and millions of things uh, but you don't uh, you don't have to uh, you know actually do the control yourself 
Okay, it is procedural and object oriented on the left side. It is usually value semantics and full of constraints based programming and functional programming on the right side. Okay, reference semantics rule on the left. On the left, you have recipes, algorithms, states, conditions, side effects, sharing, etc. There is a comma there. I, I really wanted to add more. <laughs> I think uh, on the right side, we have composition. You have little functionality in which you bring together to achieve the bigger goal. You have pure functions, lambda closures, higher order functions, lazy evaluations, even monads. Okay, you need tests to prove correctness on the left side. On the right, many a times you can design it in such a way that if it compiles, it works fine. And whatever code you write is so trivial that uh, a visual inspection can, you can write unit tests for sure, uh, but a visual inspection is good enough. We'll see some examples. Okay, and it is trivial to test. So uh, with this contrasting, uh, I just got this uh, also as uh, uh, things discussed on that web page uh, about declarative programming. And, uh, and you know, uh, by not having state, by not having sharing, you eliminate a whole class of bugs. The clarity and quick understanding enables newbies, uh, new joiners to quickly induct into the team and maintainability and speed over time of course you get okay if, if you do operations in any order you still get the same behavior and these are some of the good things i don't want to repeat okay so let's make some declarative choices of course some healthy reminders uh you know you have to write idiomatic c plus uh, plus use what you have over the years you have raii now rule of zero uh for some time now uh, copy elision, R values, uh, use temporaries, uh, use operators, including spaceship, uh, of course. Uh, and so whatever you can delegate to the compiler, just do it. Write small functions and static polymorphism, and you can you can be sure that many of those functions would be inlined, etc. Uh, you have to enable for concurrency. You have to reduce sharing and implement for parallelism. These are generic uh, guidelines anyway. So let's discuss. So uh, in my in my talk, I'll discuss in two parts, and uh, uh, and the first part is about structural composition. Okay, uh, how declarative can we get on that front? Okay, so uh, we live in the world of uh, telecommunication. We know uh, we have all uh, gone through, um, you know, the network stack. And this is what gets our machines working. And since 2020, the traffic has been increasing quite a lot. And this is the protocol stack that every message almost has to take. Uh, there might be some variations. Okay, and this network stack uh, is traversed by packets. Uh, when the application wants to send some data, it is encapsulated uh, in various of these layers, each one adding a little value. And this is the uh, final message that you uh, get at the end. Actually, the PCAP part is how we capture it and uh, how we deal with it. So the PCAP is just an encapsulation. It's a standard format of network uh, network uh, you know, packet capture. Okay. Uh, imagine this is being saved in a database. And so, uh, you know, let's say you're working in networking domain or telecom and you are saving uh, these things uh, into the PCAPs that you have heard from the network, you've captured from the network into a database, okay? And then later on, you want to view them. You want to see what happened, debug problems and solve issues and make your network better. So uh, you feel the need to fetch packets and you want uh, you know some filters to be applied. So if this is the problem domain that we are talking about, uh, what would, uh, you know, what would be the kind of things uh, we will do? What would be the kind of things that we would need to do. Okay. So we definitely have an expression. There is a way that the data has got into the database. Let's talk about uh, you know the the need to get the data from the database. Now, this is the expression, which is a very typical example that I have uh, mentioned here. IP and port has been specified by the user and anything that matches this should be uh, got and given to the user. 
So the, the user has, uh, so this can be represented as a host value, which is the IP. Okay, ignore my typo, please. Uh, it should be the same as in the expression uh, and the port value being 80, okay? So these correspond to specific data elements inside the uh, network, okay? Now, first of all, you should make strong types. If you want to deal with uh, things generically, uh, you want to be able to separate them into types. It's the uh, strong types is a, a very good facility, one of the basic ones which C++ provides. And the way to achieve a strong type is to have a type specifically done for your uh, for your data. Okay, because let's say uh, there is time, uh, which is, uh, let's say, UN64, and then there is uh, an ID, which is also UN64. And there is also, let's say, um, you know, uh, an IP pair, source and destination, which becomes UN64, two of them together. So there can be so many things that you can represent with the same data type, okay? And the uh, and the way to distinguish between what you're, the intention that you're uh, talking about is to have a strong data type like this, okay? And again, as we see here, get the compiler to do the job. Do not write the comparison. Of course, this needs C++ 20, uh, but you get the compiler to do the job. You, you work with well-known, uh, good implementations of the things that you can get, okay? And, uh, so port is represented as a U16, but we wrap it up because there can be many U16s in the system and host is an IP address. Okay, now uh, we want to represent what came in the expression as a value of type host or a value of type port. Okay, I'm just keeping it simple right now, just with two things. So uh, you have a T here, which could be any value type. And this is a wrapper which uh, allows you to hold these once you pass the expression. So if you see the expression, it is holding values, right? The expression is always about values. Uh, it's not about form or structure or messages. It's about values. So uh, if you see now uh, the host value becomes uh, a type, uh, you know, a template instantiation of value with the type host and the template instantiation of value template with the type port is the port value. And this is exactly what you got from the, uh, you know, from from uh, uh, from from the expression. Okay. Now, as you see, the expression clause needs to hold, in our current example, either a host value or a port value, right? And real implementations could have many many uh, different types of fields that you want to be able to filter on. And there could be, you could choose to do all of them or some of them or the important ones or whatever your business decision is. But of course there's a need. And the way to express any of those values being possible is via a variant. So as you see here, a variant decides whether you have a host value, uh, it can hold a host value or a port value. I hope uh, uh, you're clear about variants. Variants are called as some types. Yes, that reminds me that I should tell you about some types and product types, which come from the functional world. Now, what is a sum type? A sum type is like a variant. It can hold two different kinds, but only one value. Uh, it can, it, they, they both cannot exist at the same time in the variant and variant is always knowing uh, what value it holds. But there are two possibilities here like shown uh, and either of those could be, uh, could be present. It's one value. It's just one variant, one object, which could hold either of the two value types. Okay, on the other side, there is product, product types in the functional world, which could be uh, like I'm showing a maybe a unit eight. So either you have it or you don't. The bool tells whether you have it or not, and the real value will hold the value when it is a yes. Okay, so the, the one at the bottom is product types. And I think uh, I would like to ask you, how many different values can they hold? And it's difficult to have this answer online. So I'll proceed with giving the answer myself. On the above 512, thank you very much. That's a very good answer. And uh, we'll see how. Uh, 
For a bool, you have two possibilities, either a true or a false. Any of those values could be there in this in this object of a variant. And uh, uint8 has 256 possibilities, right? It's an 8-bit number. So in all, you could have uh, 258 different values in that variant object uh, possible, okay? It's just either of those two values could be present and the true and false are different values than the uint8 being engaged in the variant with uh, uh, any of those values, okay? So the product types, on the other hand, have both. It's like a struct, right? So the bool can have two values, either of those, and the uh, and the you know uint8 could also have a value. It's sad that I use the optional example where one implies that the other is not present. So ignore the uh, the name. But if you have a struct with these two kind of uh, things, the combination values, the unique value of this struct is uh, something that has value for both of its fields. And what are the unique value combinations that you can get? Uh, so that's two into 256, which is five and two, right? So you can have uh, all of these values. So working with values is very important. Uh, and knowing these and knowing when to exploit these are, is very important. In our world, back to expressions, uh, we have, uh, okay, okay, yeah. I wanted to go to back go back to expressions, but uh, yeah, first thing uh, to to get the values out of the variant, you have to use the the visit, and uh, for for the members, they are directly accessible with the with the dot operations. Okay, and now we can go back to the expressions. So here in our case, one expression clause is either a host or a port. Right, that is clear. And so it's a variant of host or port. And of course, there is a combination logic there. So it could either be and or or, right? So at the most basic level, now the product type has come that uh, you have a host value and an operator and another one, right? This is the our current expression, okay? Of course, there can be generic ex expressions and we can, we can work with that. So you have the, uh, so if you see here, we have named the variant with both of these possibilities as expr value so expr value can be any of these two and so we can generically write this particular very specific expression one only one kind of an expression can now be represented as a variant uh, using a variant as an expr and expr okay and of course now you have n times the possibilities like at least two types are are defined here in the expression so this could be a port and port uh, host and host Two is to two, four possibilities are already there. And to add to it, uh, if you have the and and or added to it, you have those, those many more possibilities, right? So it's great to have, uh, it's great to have this way of possibilities and products getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, letting you do a very simple implementation, but handling so many different unique uh, possibilities, okay? Now, so what can an expression look like? We just represent what we saw and discussed so far, the, the what was there in the curly braces in this way. Now I have just added a vector. Instead of adding just two explicit things, I have added a vector. Of course, we would like to have an expression which is can go forever. So I don't, we don't mind. So we have a, a vector here and a, a logical operation uh, to, to go with them. And that's the logical operation that will happen on each of the clauses which are there in the sub expressions vector. Okay, all good so far, I guess. Okay, so now you take the possible types as variadic, variadic templates. So how about you taking the host value and the port value directly into the expression, okay? Instead of having the variant, how about the struct itself, the expr itself managing the expression? So this is just like the other slide. So you have the expression and an operation. And what we just add to it is a variadic template, which could give you many, many, many possible contents of your variant of, of expression clauses. And those expression clauses become, uh, you know, uh, those expression sub expression types become the parameters of the variant. And so you get that sum type and you just hold a vector to this value type. Uh, so this is so, so, you know, this is the type trickery, which helps you uh, create many possibilities with just a very limited kind of uh, an implementation like this. At this point, I, I'm just reminded that, you know, if you think this is very small, 
uh, yes, it is good to be very small. If you think, shall, shall I create a file for half a half a page of a class or a one page class? Please go ahead. I think the, the relief that it gives you from having to keep many things in the head is, is tremendous. So this works with subclasses without knowing anything about them. Do you know what kind of sub expressions are there? This class does not know, but it can work with it. And uh, that's the beauty of uh, generic implementations. And, uh, you know, I'm calling it declarative at this point, uh, because you're just saying what you have, and each one obeys a certain trait. And that gets you all the way. Now, of course, you can have expressions of expressions. If you missed the animation, this is what it is. We had this in the previous slide, and all we did is added itself to a possibility. So now you have expression of expression, and this EXPR class is just a flat class of one expression with just one uh, one operator between many sub expressions. It's like a small bracket of an expression or a sub expression, and that's it. So this gives you infinite structure uh, in your uh, expressions. This can, as you can see, this can be a tree with many many nodes, just not two. Okay, and this uh, really gives you uh, a way to address whatever the user wants. I love this. Okay, so now that you have an expression tree. So what can we do? Of course, a tree traversal. Let's start with just printing the uh, printing the tree. Okay, that would be a traversal, right? So how easy or difficult can it be? So you have the same things, no surprises here. This is just the operator. It takes the O stream and the expression that we just defined in the previous slide. And the expression is using any of the number of sub type, sub expressions that, uh, that are there, right? So what do we write inside? Of course, the expression has an operator. So first of all, we encode, we are an and of many things, right? Many things in the vector. So we just type the operator first. And this is the output that you see here. So when this line executes, it'll say and of open bracket. And now, of course, you would have something which would print all the other nodes which are there. Now in the sub expression, uh, when you iterate over them, you will visit each one of them because on a vector, uh, on a variant, you have to visit. So on every sub expression in the uh, sub expressions vector, you visit them and uh, you make sure that you have printed them. Okay, and this prints in the order in which we read the expression IP of one, two, three, four, I have it right this time, and port as 80. And this will be the contents of the brackets and you end it and that's the tree traversal. And what about recursion? Of course, when you have an EXPR, sub EXPR type of, uh, of EXPR itself, and an expression within an expression that would land into this operator for that object here. Okay. And uh, the good thing is what we did was the, you know, all the possibilities are known and enumerated first, right? In the, uh, in the sub expressions, uh, variadic template. And so all your children are also the same type. It's just one, this one function, which has been stamped out for every unique combination of uh, variadic uh, set uh, and that one function is able to recursively deal with the things and this is as uh, easy as it gets okay now a little more involved let's actually evaluate the expression okay now when we want to evaluate the expression uh, this time we have the expression and we have a packet to match it. Evaluation of a, of a filter expression, in this case, is to match a packet, uh, which you would have got from the database. Okay, so we have an eval here, which is going to match work on this packet P. Okay, uh, and so it's just like the previous, uh, uh, this is a starting point of an expression and a packet. Now, what do you do? What is a packet? Packet, uh, I've used C++20 span. Uh, which just says that I'm not going to touch the bytes. It's a const uint8 uh, span. So it knows about a block or a buffer of uh, bytes in memory. Okay. Okay. Inside, even in the print, we first th thought of uh, printing the 
uh, the the expression uh, the operator here uh, this is a very smart way of doing it for example if you have an or operator uh, you would like to short circuit it the moment you saw a successful clause right so you have let's say 10 clauses in your expression you go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and let's say in the nth one, let's say the third one, you saw that it evaluated to true. Now you don't need to evaluate the rest, right? That's what even C and C++ do. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we also want to do. So what we want to decide is the bool value of the expression evaluation when we want to stop it. So in case of or, the moment you see a true expression, you don't want to evaluate any further. You know the final result is going to be true. You come out, stop. On the other hand, if you come across, uh, if you have an AND operator, as you evaluate, everything should be true for AND to be finally true. The moment you see the first false, a false ANDed with anything else will always be false and you can just stop there and say false is my answer, right? So AND stops at false and OR stops at true in order of evaluation, right? So we'll go through the vector now or as obviously expected. But this is the loop exit condition, right? Now, I've used a standard algorithm here and I've shown you the most important bits. You want to find if in the sub expressions from, from the starting to the end, from begin to the end, you have any value of T inside the packet P, which matches the value that you expect. Okay, so, uh, that's that's what we have here okay i have not shown you what get value does we'll get there but you can see it is going to get a t from the packet and the val is what you got in the expression which is 1.2.3.4 as the ip okay or the port 80 okay and then there is support code which we need to write once and with this eval we encapsulate the logic in one point and in one place and everywhere else we uh, can just uh, reuse this and you have to write uh, some some decisions you have to make these decisions and some of these are runtime decisions uh, like what is the expression you got and what is the packet that you got and are they matching so this thing cannot happen at compile time and you have to make these decisions the good thing about making it uh, local is that the rest of the code it can continue to be just declarative all right so uh, so what do we have to do uh, what do we do here uh, i'll just go through the lines the sub expressions have exp uh, expressions vector has sub expressions you pick that and which is uh, which is a variant right so you visit the sub expressions variant with this lambda and i have picked the template type here from uh, from from the sub expressions and uh, I'm able to pass it to the get value function. Okay. So whatever is the value. Hello. Uh, somebody said can't hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's it. Um, I mean, you can read this, uh, but the moment you hit the loop exit condition, whatever you decided based on the, uh, based on the bool, that's when you stop. Okay. So, and that's it. This is the complex logic of evaluation and entire tree, evaluation of an entire tree. And of course, this can go recursive and try to address uh, all levels that you have in your expression. Okay. Now, get value. Now, get value actually needs to pick something from somewhere. Let's say there's an IPv6 header and you want to pick from the IPv6 header. Uh, a source address or something, right? Because in this case, we have the host, which is the IP address, right? So we want the source address uh, from, from this IPv6 header. Even though we are not going to use this struct much, we create this uh, struct in order to be declarative and to be clear what our uh, what we are talking about. So if you just create this struct and uh, never instantiate uh, you know, it ever, it's fine but it is a very good definition of what the IP is. And this is also an opportunity for you to know where the source address is in case you got a packet, okay? So it's just 100% declarative. 
it's just used to get the offset of fields and how let's see so so we have a generic function called as get value which can take any t and it does not know what to do right it does not know its t but we have to specialize for every type that you're working on for example here it is ip and so when you have a packet for the ip what you want to do is uh, create a local variable uh, and the, the idea of all of these uh, types and definitely in the networking domain uh, you have most of the types uh, all the types as values okay so you can just deal with values and they are not very huge values the biggest ones would be ipv6 which is 16 bytes okay so uh, so so you copy out let's say it's an ipv4 or ipv6 so you have uh, this ip of size 4 or 16 and you copy the bytes from where so in the in the packet which was just a span if you remember in the packet uh, span you pick from the ipv6 header where the source ip field is this is a c construct uh, and i did not check whether this is uh, it works definitely i think it works uh, it would it would land into problems if we have templates involved here uh, so 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 source ip uh, is a field inside the ip header and what this thing is doing is getting the byte offset to the first byte of source ip okay and then you have the size of ip telling you how many bytes should be there for sure and uh, you want to just copy it down into this memory, which is the IP that you want to return. So by value, it is copied a few bytes. Uh, you might not realize, and you just return, okay? Uh, it might all stay in memory, I mean, in registers <laughs> for all we know. So, so this is a very cheap way of getting the value, and it is so declarative and uh, vocal that, you know, it says I'm picking the offset of IP header from IP header uh, of the of the member source, uh, and I'm copying these many bytes into this one. That's it, and you have your object. Okay. Sometimes uh, you know uh, I can think of a case. For example, uh, you have a much higher level object in the T, which you have here. Like we are saying, IP is a literal value of what is there in the packet. But you might want to have hold something much bigger or uh, something complex or different. But uh, I would say this really, uh, uh, it is a choice and I think I have, uh, we will talk about that. So let's say uh, that you have a message, inside the message you have some type T's and there could be many of them. For example, in case of an uh, IP, uh, you can have an IP uh, source and uh, a destination IP, right? So you might want to pick and you might want to just have some occurrence. It's just a way of knowing uh, which item you are talking about if you want to be specific. For example, sometimes like in the expression we have, the user has just said IP is 1.2.3.4. Which one? They mean both, right? Any of them, uh, any of the IPs. Because if you send a message in your request, you are the source and in the response of the same, you are the destination. Sometimes you don't care or sometimes you do. So you should be able to specify all of that. So if you, if you specify an occurrence, you are talking about that one if you don't there is an uh, you know any kind of a uh, uh, kind of a magic value which should just get uh, all of them okay check mo more than one of them okay so this what the way this works is this needs a specialization of get value like we saw in the other one and uh, this holds the field from the expression the value from the uh, from the expression okay now of course this is uh, replicated from there and get value knows how to pick the data now in in the get value because it was for a certain type we knew how to pick the data but if you use the field representation that we have on the previous slide uh, which is a generic way of representing any field this one uh, you could actually not know about the field and pick the field struct which you maybe you have pro you have been provided or look up the field uh, struct and then just uh, just use the offsets here uh, in order to get to the real bytes that you want. Okay, I let this out as an exercise. Okay, uh, but I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, apart from the occurrence, you you might actually hold choose to hold. This is another uh, just way of doing the same thing, a variation. 
to choose to hold the offset. So now you're still looking for the size of T number of bytes, but at two different offsets. And that's what separates these two fields. Again, this one is not holding a lot uh, of information. All these things are just compile time constructs, which will be all gone and uh, directly offsets will be used. Uh, you might need to calculate the offsets like Intel also deals with this kind of, uh, this kind of messaging and message uh, uh, parsing. And uh, you can see talks from uh, Michael Case, even Ben Dean gave some talks and Luke Pahanti uh, like to talk about this. So uh, they have uh, a concept of an MSB because they are working inside the, in the internals of a processor and they do care about the MSB and uh, LSB. Sorry, that's a copy paste error. One of this is MSB and one of this is LSB, like this one is saying. So uh, they just want to note that in the buffer, which bit to which bit you're talking about. And sometimes these bits cross the byte boundaries and they are not just two, three bits. They are, let's say, 14 bits, uh, which is crossing a byte boundary and, you know, six bits here and eight bits there. So uh, so in absolute, they are having this. It's just a way of representing. I'm just presenting uh, how you can do it. And byte offset is calculated by the offset of the start, uh, you know, minus the start of the buffer itself, of the message itself, right? So that's a calculation I'm not showing each one of them, but I wanted to show this and you can look at this talk at the right bottom, uh, which is the source of this information. All right, okay, so sorry about that slide. Okay, now, ignore this one. Okay, so so we have now got our way around the things that, uh, you know, that are holding real packets, but like, like you're asked in interviews and like life is, things change. Maybe you have some data in the database, which is having some metadata. It is not a standard kind of a message, but it is a custom, some uh, some specific kind of a message. But you need to give the same kind of response to a user querying for IP 1234 and port 80, even if this kind of data is there in your database. Your data should look like a, 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 a PCAP captured from the network, even though it is actually not, right? We do these kind of things. So this uh, additionally could be a requirement. And if you see, we want to encode each of these layers which are there in the protocol stack. So we have Ethernet, IP, UDP, and uh, and the data layer. Data layer is up to the application and data layer is what might what is already saved in the database. So all concrete encoders model the encoder concept. We were talking about concept in the previous talk also. It's a significant uh, uh, feature from C20, which I really uh, uh, say is, you know, show me your concepts and uh, I'll uh, I'll know what implementation you have done. It's like, show me your friends and I know what you are. So, uh, you know, concepts really puts in the discipline. It is this which specifies what your types should do and what you should, you should not. And like it was mentioned in the previous hour also, it, it will point out any misinstantiations that you might attempt at your end. Okay, so what is an encoder? Let's talk about the core things of them. There could be a few things like we have the encoding of a header, of a trailer, of a padding byte, uh, and of the value itself. Okay, so maybe the value is encoded in base 64 for something. For example, if you have a JSON encoder, you cannot write the bytes as they are raw. So you have to do a base 64. So there are uh, these Kind of things but i'm for the slide where i'm keeping it very simple an encoder is a, a type which has a value type okay uh it's the it's the type that it deals with and around it it could estimate the size okay and uh, when you call estimate size it can predict what kind of size it will need for this kind of a packet. So you just look at the size of the current bytes and you estimate what kind of uh, bytes you might need. For example, something like base64 inflates the data by 43%. Uh, if you have an encryption, you don't know how much it will be. Uh, if you uh, just have to keep the bytes, for example, an IP layer just adds before and after or nothing after, maybe just before, uh, you just, just adds on to the bytes. And why we want this estimate is to be able to predict what Kind of memory allocation we should do so that in one pass we are able to write everything okay and then finally you have to write it so you want to encode and you here now deal with the meta object which is the meta info of every packet and this is the real packet itself okay 
So no surprises here. It should give you back a new buffer, which is, and as you see, it is an owned memory. Uh, the vector will manage it, right? Okay, so now encoding applies, uh, you know, uh, you know, now applies, so let, let's say you got a custom data from somewhere, uh, you got the M, the meta and the data itself. And now you call a UDP encoder to, to do your first step. So you just pass the M and data exactly what we expected from, as mentioned in the concept, and you should get back a vector. So you know what this is, this is actually a vector, right? And this vector can easily be converted into span. I hope you all know that. Like if you just pass a vector to this variable, it will be converted into a span because span knows how to create itself from a vector. Okay, and so the entire network work stack can be put together. I've shown you one. Uh, I've shown you the concept and I've not even shown you any of the concrete classes, but they will have the same structure as we discussed. And so if we create a protocol encoder stack with many of these encoders and uh, a variant which is actually uh, able to hold any of those possibilities at at different indexes at different levels as you see in the stack uh, you now have a protocol stack protocol encoder stack in your implementation and they are the sub encoders which you can have and you could have sub of sub or whatever so you can imagine uh, this can be constructed by uh, by having many of the protocols. So if you see here, there is a clear one-to-one -one correspondence and even a visible, uh, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence between what the stack looks like in your explanatory diagrams and what a declarative uh, kind of protocol stack you are able to create. Right. So this is uh, how you can actually create an encoder. And let me tell you, the protocol encoder stack itself is also an encoder okay and uh, it would have the same kind of interfaces of course as you expect inside the protocol encoder stack it would either it would do a an iteration of how many items uh, whatever number of items are there inside uh, you know inside the vector you could do a fold expression if you uh, hold the variant uh, variadic types directly uh, into the protocol encoder so that could be a, an approach and fold expressions would give you efficiency using vector is still a runtime okay and so as you see even this app encoder which is actually a protocol encoder is actually uh it models the encoder and this is how you check the concept that app encoder is an encoder and this is true check that compile time All right, so we have the entire network stack here. It is totally declarative. Encoders provide a size which allows for single allocation. So we can sum up all the size. Uh, protocol stack encoder, uh, encoder stack can sum up all the sizes. You can have just one allocation and you start at a point and you just build up your message, right? Encoders uh, increment in, incrementally, uh, encode incrementally over the data. Contents of the previous layer are the input to the next layer, right? So your span becomes whatever the previous one gave, like the vector that was given. And concept allows uh, to catch any uh, deviations from what you want from sanity, basically. And the code is actually a spec. Okay. There are many things that we can do. Uh, otherwise, little ones, uh, like passing arguments to, uh, to a function. For example, the send here is taking vector or a vector of encrypted message. So if you are sensitive that, you know, a certain uh, send should only work with encrypted messages, maybe you have a conflict to choose it, or maybe it's a it's a choice uh, that you know over time you have made. Previously you started with unencrypted, now you are all encrypted. So you can switch uh, your interface. And because you have this strong type of encrypted message, you cannot pass a regular message if you have not made it convertible. And so, uh, this really enforces your correctness in the program and you just can't pass the wrong thing. So the compiler will definitely make sure that you, uh, it is enforcing at you the correct use of the API, right? And here, encryptor might just be a wrapper. It might be no cost wrapper, but it is a different type just because uh, it is a layer over the message, right? Only in program. 
So like unique pointer is exactly the size of a pointer. If you don't have a, a Lambda deleter, which occupies space, if you just have a deleter, which is a function, just does something, uh, that function need not be stored in, stored in every object. So the size of a unique pointer uh, is with such a simple function uh, for deleter is actually the same as that of a pointer. But you get all the functionality. See, I, I like this getting things for free. And that's what we are doing here. Okay. And your encryptor can just be just to complete the story here. Encryptor can be, uh, uh, oh, that's a copy paste thing. Uh, so here you say encryptor dot encrypt this message and you get an encrypted message. Okay. Sorry about this. I'll correct the slides. So this would uh this would make sure and you have to make sure that encrypted message is not instantiable by anybody else it's just not possible to get it other than calling this function so you would always be correct right we know how to uh, how to make uh, constructors unavailable for certain types uh, and or they could be internal types to private types inside a class so you have options there right now when you're passing arguments, which one do you prefer? The idiomatic style has been const ref, uh, but we also have R value ref. Which one should you choose? Now, uh, you know, whichever you specify, the compiler can actually enforce optimal use. In case you want to take control, you would use the R value of the thing because you will reuse the message or just gobble it up after you have sent the message. Maybe the messages are, are, are not useful anymore. So they can be used or reused inside the uh, vector. Maybe the maybe the sender is a buffered sender. So it would keep to it would need to hold on. So without create, creating a copy, it will keep things. OK, so but pass by reference here is not to share, but just to uh, even in the first example, it's just to prevent a copy. And that cost we pay in case what if you call a, a you know a concurrent send which would take your reference and your vector would go out of scope and would just die down but this other uh, concurrently running construct now has a reference to your died vector and you would see all kinds of bad behavior and segmentation faults etc so when working concurrently let the argument either be r value or just a direct plain value this one works Right? And it would just create a move if you have a vector. Uh, don't let it create a copy. So uh, if you have a, a dispensable vector, okay? And always for concurrency, prom promote, uh, you, you should you should uh, prefer a unidirectional style where you pass on something to a thread and vector, uh, thread or uh, another concurrently executing construct and you just get a final response back, okay? But sometimes you do need a shared object and you pass, uh, you should rather pass the values. You should avoid sharing. But if you have to do, you have to be aware of what RBI says. Pass by values, Kijiye. And Dal Sevachi, right? Poor guy, his name is there in the law. He gave a good one. So it uh, the number of parallelism that you can have in the system is restricted by how much shared uh, ownership you have or sharing you have. So just a quick uh, shout out to uh, Copper Spice. They have created this guarded thing. This is again a declarative approach of concurrently handling something. You have a T and if you have a guarded T, you know the T is inside it, but there is a mutable mutex here, uh, which will be uh, not available to you. So the only way to get it is by calling uh, a function called as lock. Okay, so they have, uh, the way they have done is, uh, they have a deleter which would delete. Uh, which would do the job of, uh, you know, giving back the object or something. Uh, a handle is just a unique pointer with that deleter. Okay. So now there is some little bookkeeping which this uh, deleter is doing and you get a unique pointer out of this and you have a handle lock and a const handle lock, right? So if you have a const guarded object, you can only call, call the const one and you will get a const object. You cannot do anything like editing it. But if you have a, uh, an object, a guarded T, which you have, uh, you can do read write, then you will call the form over. Okay. And so this is the use, I guess. Uh, you use it constantly for constant API, fine. If you use non const API for constant, not fine. And non const API for, for a read write object, fine. Okay. So summarizing 
structurally speaking, composition, composition, composition is what we did. Use strong types, use value types, let types model concepts, variadic uh, templates and fold expressions and some types can be used, small separate composable things so that you can do uh, bigger things and many fold increase the possibilities of handling many things generically. Generic implementations and specializations are there, giving up options. Uh, you, you might sometimes want to give up options because you can get much more by giving up something and exploit the strength of C++. Okay, and with this kind of a thing, if your code compiles, it works. So that was the part one. So we have a question here. Can you discuss the role of const expert, especially in the context of zero cost abstractions? Yeah, so uh, we saw we had some const expert calculations which were happening uh, all at compile time, uh, which were calculating the offset. So if your domain renders you to be able to do const expert, for example, if you see Hannah Dusikova's uh ctre which is a compile time regular uh, regular expression uh, she parses the regular expression at compile time and creates uh, uh some objects which actually represent and uh, she's able to do it in really direct like if you hand wrote the assembly uh, that kind of uh, code is generated by by the context per uh, parsing on herself so uh there are many domains, for example, I showed messages. I've not got to it, but I really feel that we should have parsers of messages. Although what I showed to you was A, B, and F. I showed you the easy ones. Uh, there are some other ways of representing messages, which I would love to have the input uh, as input, and uh, it should generate the code to parse it. Uh, there are many DSL languages actually to do that. So there isn't a lot of, uh, so you really have to know what you want to do.